and welcome to the CSE Knowledge Hub webinar uh, to promote the CSE theme of Science and Technology for Development. Today's webinar will be for one hour and the format of the webinar will include a presentation by our webinar speaker followed by a Q&A session towards the end. Please use the questions function to the end, uh, towards the end of, of your, your presentation um, to send in any questions you might have for our webinar speaker. Please also note that this webinar is being recorded and the recording will be shared on CSE's YouTube channel and on the Science and Technology Hub after the webinar. Today's webinar is on a very interesting topic, which is opportunities for artificial <clears throat> intelligence research in Africa and the case of PAPS AI in Uganda. And I'm very happy to introduce Dr. Vaswa William to present this webinar topic. Dr. Vaswa is a 2018 split site PhD scholar from Uganda. He completed his PhD in biomedical engineering at the University of Strathclyde and the Mubara University of Science and, Technolo uh, Science and Technology. He also currently serves as the senior lecturer and the head of department of biomedical sciences and engineering at the Mubara University of Science and Technology. He also leads as the advanced, uh, he also leads the advanced medical imaging and artificial intelligence lab in the same department. Apart from his academic roles, he's also a CEO of the Digital Health Uganda Limited, which is a startup aiming to revolutionize the healthcare system in Uganda by using artificial intelligence, 3D printing, and cloud computing technologies to improve patient outcomes while reducing the total cost of care. So from my introduction of Dr. Vaswa, um, you can make out that he's very interested in digital health innovations uh, that provides universal health coverage especially reaching the unreached. In today's webinar, he will talk about his expertise on artificial intelligence, especially in the context of Africa, and his own innovations called PAPS AI, which is an outcome of his PhD research. Um, and without any further ado, I am now going to invite Dr. Vaswa to present his topic. And once again, please remember to use the questions function to send in your questions for the Q&A session later. Dr. Waswa, over to you. My name is Dr. William Waswa from Uganda. Like earlier introduced, I was a PhD split site scholarship. I had a PhD split site scholarship in 2018 at the University of Strathclyde. And I'm really happy to present today's webinar of science and technology for development. I'll be talking about opportunities for, for AI research in Africa, and I'll be talking about PAPS AI use case in Uganda. So AI has potential and a lot of opportunities in Africa. This range from health, agriculture, education, government, and financial services. And when you talk about health, AI has potential because we have a lot of health challenges especially when it comes to number of medical workers, where we find that our patient, our doctor to patient ratio is one to two to 50,000. So we we'll note that AI has potential in the diagnosis of a number of diseases. For example, in this presentation, I'll be showing you how I've used AI for cervical cancer diagnosis. Let me tell you a story before I tell you more about this innovation or about this research that I will be presenting. In 2016, I was working on medical equipment in a, in a pathology department and by medical engineer by training. So I observed how long it would take a cytopathologist or a cytotechnician to analyze one pap smear and a microscope. This is an example of a microscope. And under during this time, very many other patients are outside, outside waiting for their results. So in addition to this, I have a friend, I won't tell you the true name, the real name, but let's just call her Mary. Mary visits a regional federal hospital for cervical cancer screening. She's diagnosed 
with for surgical cancer and she receives, receives her results two weeks later and she, got, she has a negative diagnosis. Three months later, she goes back for a review and she's diagnosed with late stage surgical cancer. And three years down the road, Mary dies. So there are so many other Marys who are outside there who are dying of surgical cancer due because of late stage diagnosis, which is caused by a number of, which is caused by very many points. Ladies and gentlemen, our innovation is PAPS AI, which is a, a low cost digital platform for surgical cancer management in low resource constrained areas. It has, it's a, it has a series of hardware and AI powered software innovations that makes surgical cancer diagnosis and record management faster and more efficient. PAPS AI consists of a low cost 3D printed digital microscope site scanner and a digital oncology information management platform. Why did we spend or why did we invest time in this AI research? This was part of my com my scholarship in the UK. When I was doing my PhD research. So we observed that actually surgical cancer globally ranks as the fourth most prevalent cancer with over 500 women diagnosed with surgical cancer in 2019. And unfortunately, the highest incidences of surgical cancer occur in low and middle income countries. In Africa, 80% of these incidences occur in Africa. Back home here in Uganda, we are ranked 14th globally and 7th in Africa with the highest incidences of cervical cancer. And unfortunately, 85% of women diagnosed with cervical cancer in Uganda always die because of late stage diagnosis. But cervical cancer can be prevented. And pap smear is one of the commonest and regular approach used for screening cervical cancer. However, it has challenges. It is the manual analysis of the pap smears and the microscope is time consuming, laborious, and error prone. It is very subjective and error prone, as hundreds of sub images have to be a trained cytopathologist who are also very few in Africa. The digital microscopes that are available are very expensive and have had limited impact. One of the microscopes that are there is called the Mark Head Olympus Microscope with so many heads, which has to be used by three homocytopathologists simultaneously. The available low-cost microscopes are manual, and these have limited capability of digitizing these images for late stage analysis. Also risk factors analysis is not fully incorporated into the screening process. And lastly, the manual storage of patient data. All this makes patients fail to come or to return for follow-up. And these are some of the reasons why surgical cancer is still one of the commonest cancers in Africa. So our solution has an automated low-cost digital microscope side scanner, an automated pap smear analysis tool. Then we have an automated cervical cancer factors evaluation to automatically assess the likelihood of somebody contracting cervical cancer based on the risk factors. Then you have an integrated cervical cancer patient information management platform. And this is the platform we have built, which I really take credit to the Commonwealth scholarships because I was able to do some of this advanced research when I was in the UK. After accessing some of the resources I had not, I was not able to access back home at Embarrow University of Science and Technology. So the microscope, the microscope is developed using a 3D modeling software. We 3D print it, and then we have an AI-powered digital platform. So we have done rigorous tests on the platform. For example, we have looked at the classification accuracy of our risk factors assessment. So this platform will ask a patient, how old are you? When did you start having sex? How many kids do you have? What was the age for the first birth? Do you smoke? Do you have HIV? So they ask these questions to patients so that this, the gynecologist or the cytopathologist can try to predict the chances of this person having cervical cancer, but it's done manually. So with our platform, we have automated this platform or this workflow. And from the tests we have done, 
with the experts, we have able we have been able to receive 100% correlation on sofa 60 files that we have tested on the platform. We have we have also tested the pap smear analysis tool to be able to say if our platform can be able to classify the image or the pap smear as cancerous and non cancerous and then classify the stage of the cancer. So we have tested this on two data sets. One data set has two nine seven full test images, and we have been able to get an overall accuracy of 97% on this data set. We have also tested it recently on 60 pathology slides from a cancer clinic. We are actually doing more tests because one of the challenges we, we had was to get data sets or to get the data sets to train our classification model. But when we developed our microscope, we are using this microscope to cap to digitize images, but we're also trying to get images that have been obtained using other microscopes to try and see how our classification model works. So the overall accuracy on this data set has been 95%. So PAPS AI has been an interesting research for the last three years during my PhD and after, after uh, even after my PhD, I'm still continuing this type of research. This innovation has been internationally recognized at 2019 Common Red Semesters meeting in Geneva. And I'm happy to know that it was the only innovation present, represented from Africa. This innovation has also been selected among the top 30 WHO African innovations for 2019. And recently, in 2020, this innovation was selected on the five for the finalists for the Lawyer Academy of Engineering. Every year, the Lawyer Academy has what they call the African Engineering Innovations. And we are happy to note that we were among the top four finalists. And we have been able to publish around six papers now. So we have more papers we are working on for this inno innovation and this publications are readily available for review so but what are some of the challenges what are some of the challenges of carrying out ai research in africa one of the biggest challenges from experience is data sets so initially our problem was how can we analyze pap smears automatically that was the problem so then we said with ai we can analyze these pap smears but then the challenge was okay where do we get data sets from we searched online most of the data sets we could get you could run models there run the model with real data sets from the hospital you would get an accuracy of around 38 percent then we said the data sets that are available can be good for learning but for clinical innovations for clinical validation of this i think we didn't have enough data sets so actually from there we said okay instead of just analyzing these pap smears let's develop our own microscope then we developed our own microscope so we have developed our microscope so after developing the microscope we said wow but then these images from the microscope we need to have a data set how are we going to store them because currently in the hospital they have a, a folder on the computer images are just put there so we said no let's have a platform to keep storing these images. So one of the challenges we observed that AI research in Africa faces the, one of the challenges of data sets. The data sets are typically smaller because they are not stored regularly. The metadata is not available. If you have data sets available, you don't know how they were captured, how, because they are not well documented. However, one thing you observe that the data sets actually are available because in Africa, unlike in US and UK, where there are data protection laws that protect individual privacy, these are just coming in Africa. For example, in Uganda, Data Protection and Privacy Act was signed in 2019, and it's not yet. It's, a, it's now a law, but, a practice, but implementing it is not yet fully. In South Africa, it has also just been signed. So actually in Africa, few countries have these laws so we could actually use that opportunity opportunity to actually have more data for ai research still some of the challenges of ai research in africa they still limited expertise in ai 
there are opportunities or there are platforms like A Research Africa, Data Science Africa, that try to provide trainings in AI, but you still believe, we have still noted that there are few experts in Africa. Most of the AI platforms, AI innovations in Africa are actually being developed from outside Africa. Even when it comes to research, we see that actually few Africans or few universities in Africa are doing the real core AI research. For example, in Uganda, we just have one university that offers a master's degree in AI. That's actually that's the degree I wanted to do for my master's, but I couldn't get it in Africa. And I had the scholarship that was only giving me a, an opportunity to do it from Africa. So I ended up doing a master's in biomedical engineering, but I still concentrated more on the artificial intelligence part. Then we also have limited adoption of information systems in Africa. You go to hospitals, we still have paper forms, we still have files in hard copy. So starting to automate this using AI becomes hard because the data is not there. Also, we have a lot of information systems, but they are standalone. They don't communicate. They don't have application programming interfaces to link them. So this creates still a gap in data. And also, when you want to do, most of the students have seen when they want to say, I want to do research in AI, they go on the internet, they look for data sets. But when you try to analyze some of these data sets, they say they are for Africa, but they are not from the Africa's population. So you find out that actually you are using a data set for cervical cancer of patients from India, and you want to validate and test or pilot this project in Africa. So these are some of the challenges we have noted. But what could be the way forward? How can we work together as CSI innovation or CSI alumni? How can we work together? So they still need skilled Africans with emerging AI technologies or techniques. Yes, opportunities are there, but they still need to skill Africans with these techniques. And this should not only be academia, because I don't think you can get a common knowledge scholarship when you're not in a university. You need to be into an academic institution. But there are startups, Africa now has come up after a recent report shows that there are a lot of startups in Uganda, in Kenya, in South Africa. So there should also be opportunities to get people who are into startups and empower them. Because actually, most of these startups are the ones solving the real challenges. They are the ones solving the real problems. Some of the research in universities is just on top there, high impact publications but sometimes it's not solving the real problem. So there is also still a need for freely easily accessible online courses. There are courses like Coursera, FutureLearn, yes, those courses are there, I've done a number of them, but I believe there's still a need for more easily accessible courses and also need to organize more AI competitions. This will motivate students into AI. For example, just pose a challenge and you say want to come up with the best AI model for self-driving car in Uganda. Because we're not going to get a self-driving car from Silicon and bring it on roads in Kampala. That will not work. But if we have challenges or competitions, I believe Africans can actually come up with such innovations and strengthen partnerships. The partnership I established between Imbara University in Uganda, University of Strength Pride in, 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 in UK, Glasgow, wouldn't have been possible if the Commonwealth Scholarship was not there. So there is need for more avenues to see how the partnerships are built because the expertise I got from UK has helped me to solve challenges in Uganda. And I've used the same techniques to apply it to other areas. For example, I'm working on 3D printing of face masks. I'm working on an AI model for, for of 19 diagnosis from just X-ray images, but I'm using the same skills. So there is just still need to strengthen partnerships between academic institutions and the private sector. So these partnerships should not only be Mbarara University of Science and Technology and University of Strathclyde, but also University of Strathclyde and maybe a research institute or a private company or Minister of Health in Uganda. So such partnerships can really make this more happen. Then they also need to empower Africans to build AI models for existing challenges. I've 
I'm happy that I've done some courses in design thinking, and I believe that best way to solve a problem is to create a challenge. Let's create challenges and put up competitions to look for Africans to build AI models for this. And also the general education curriculum. I got to know about AI in, in Cape Town when I was doing my master's. When I was doing my bachelor's, I even didn't know what AI was about. So I, I believe there's need to actually start bringing AI, emerging technologies, robotics, 3D printing to even secondary, to high, to high education. So the earlier I bring these concepts to students, the better we prepare them to do more advanced research when they're still young. And setting up centers of excellence in machine learning, this can also facilitate AI research. When I was doing my image analysis, I had my laptop, which I wanted to set the specifications, but I would process an image for around 30 images, for around, for around 13 minutes, just processing an image. When I got my scholarship, Commonwealth scholarship, I went in the UK. Wow, there was a server where images we are sending. Students would be in their hostels and run images in the cloud on the server that was in the lab. I was like, what's happening? So I talked to my supervisor and I was so happy that the Commonwealth gave me some funds and I was able to buy a laptop with a GPU. So with this type of laptop, I was processing images that I wouldn't have processed with my computer. But these machines were expensive. When I tried to see how much it was costing, it was very expensive. So there's need to set up centers of excellence in machine learning. These, would, these should be well equipped with infrastructure to support people do AI, because you're not going to tell anybody to do AI when they don't have these facilities. And they also need for government support open data initiatives, because like I've said, data is one of the biggest challenges. And let's just think common with a scholarship. This is something that I thought about when I was in the UK. And when I was invited for this, I said, I have to bring it and, and mind and also just share it with you. Instead of having only African researchers go to UK to for the common research scholarship, if you have also a UK researcher coming to Uganda, this can actually be very helpful because this person is go, this person has the expertise, but maybe it doesn't you know it doesn't know the problem. So when this person comes here and sees the real challenge, they can actually even provide the more opportunities. They can actually because when you get a clear understanding of the challenges requiring AI techniques. This can be very grateful. I'm the Department of Biomedical Engineering, and in a few before COVID, I used to bring students from John Hopkins, Tumbara University. We have a program, but the students would actually see a lot of challenges that they never expected existed. And such would be here for like three weeks. So if I have a PhD master's student from UK, Tumbara University, to Uganda Cancer Institute, this person can actually do a lot. And during this, they can train more students through the peer, peer engagement, because the students will work with others, and by the end, everyone has become an expert. Yeah, and this type of work I've been working on, or I'm working on, is in line with AI Sustainable Development Goals, for example, for the UN Sustainable Development Goals, really, for good health and well-being. And it's also in line with the Uganda National Development Plan, where they are saying health first. So, we all oh, I note that AI has potential and it has been recognized by all UN Sustainable Development Goals, by national priority programs, that innovations or work that uses AI to improve the health lives and promote well-being for all at all stages is really very important. What are some of the opportunities for collaboration as I finalized? Um, as earlier introduced, I'm from Barra University of Science and Technology. The Department of Medical Sciences and Engineering. I also lead the Advanced Medical Imaging and Artificial Intelligence Lab, where we do have research in digital pathology. We do a lot of medical image analysis. We have been working on pap smears for surgical cancer, expanding it for retina image, image analysis for diagnosis. We also do it for malaria slides. And recently, we got an award with, with my partner. Dr. Jones of Bongrot, and we're building a first MRI machine in Africa. So we shall be using still AI to diagnose hydrocephalus from these MRI images. So there are really potential for collaboration. 
and we also have expertise in building health information systems, especially with telemedicine support and also building medical devices. Because when you come to Mbara, you, you, you not you never felt your Camtech, which is a center for a consortium for affordable medical technologies, which is also in Mbara University of Science and Technology. So thank you so much. Thank you so much for your time and for listening. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Baswa. Uh, that was a brilliant presentation on your work within artificial intelligence. Uh, that was really brilliant presentation uh, about the challenges of, of uh, artificial intelligence in Africa. And also, thank you for helping us understand some of the, the, the ways forward uh, to overcome these challenges. I would now like to begin the question and answer session. Um, and would like to invite our attendees to send in your questions. Uh, you may send in your questions using the questions function. Um, we do have a few questions, Dr. Waswa, and I would like to uh, just address those questions that have come up for you. The first question that we have received from our attendee named Hafiz. Uh, thank you, Hafiz, for sending in your question. Uh, Dr. Waswa, the question is, on um, how did you train the artificial intelligence tool, which is considered to be a true model? And the following question is also about, um, is, is the artificial intelligence tool uh, built on local data set or have you used uh, the WHO data set? Yeah, thank you so much. So initially for training, the data set before we actually built our own microscope, we were using freely available online data sets for WHO. Actually, that's the data set we are using, freely available. But when we went into clinical testing to see whether really this can work on data from the from the cancer clinic, we realized that actually we are far from the truth. That's why we started to build our own microscope and try to be able to obtain our own images. So currently this, we are using our own data sets on a local data set. How we have trained it? So initially, when you look at most of those papers we have published, we first started with clinical, actually we didn't, this project has actually emerged. Initially it was called PAD, it was a pap semi analysis tool. It was just using classical image analysis we moved from PAT to PA to PAP ES. PAP ES, it was PAP smear expert system, where we said instead of using this mathematical algorithm, let us use the rules. So we are using expert systems, but then we also saw it, it was not flexible enough. The sensation specificity was not good. Then we said, uh uh, no, we have run away from using expert rules. Let us run away from using the mandani fuse logic let us go into the planning that's why the last concept so the current prototype is called the PAPS ai and now we are using artificial intelligence and we're using the deep planning where we have a data set of around 1000 i think 1800 images now we have used to, to test and it is based on a neural network so i developed a deep learning approach based on on, on the neural network and we have a paper available for, for how we have done this because we really want to make it open source for research. Thank you so much for your for clarifying that, that question, um, Dr. Waswa. Um, we have another question around uh, you know partnerships and stakeholder management and uh, you have touched upon uh, working in partnerships uh, within the field of AI. So this question is more about uh, how important is, important is stakeholder management and uh, buy-in to building AI practice and innovation in Africa. And do you think that um, are there any key stakeholders you work with or want to work with? Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, actually one of the key stakeholders, that's why actually I've said partnerships are very, very good because for example, IBM 
when I started training some of these models, I wanted a partner to, to, to be able to store, to run this, this, to run this in the cloud. So, but now when you go to IBM, these are very expensive virtual platforms. IBM, Amazon, they all have IAI packages, but my sister, they are a bit expensive. So if you have partners in terms of technique, I would they call them cloud serving cloud service partners. They would really be very helpful because I was happy that I I managed to win and and was I went on to an accelerator program it's called AI Africa accelerator program, and we are able to get some free tokens from IBM for that period of one year. And during that time, I used to access these on on because I think they bought, but it was very expensive for me as an individual. So even universities, if you have a partnership with some of these people or with some of these companies, you can be able to receive such support you need. Then when it also comes to policy, for example, when you want to get some of these data sets, you need to be able to go to hospital. Some hospitals will ask you for clearance from research ethics committee. Sometimes to get a research ethics committee, you need clearance from the ministry. So when you have partnerships with policies like ministry, the hospitals, it's also very, very important or helpful to have this type of research. Then the other one are the technical partners. Me, I always seek for technical partners. I always like them because one thing I've known, you, we can always learn. I really wanted this work, but my hands were a bit tied when I was in Uganda. When I got this street site, I was so happy because I met a Dr. Mario from University of Strathclyde. He actually, he, he kick-started me so much. So those are all partners. So which means if I didn't go to such partner, I wouldn't actually have been able to do all this type of work. And we are open for partners as a university, very open for more partners. Thank you, Dr. Vaswa, for uh, providing that information about the importance of uh, working in partnerships with various stakeholders uh, in, in your work. We have another question from, um, from Hafiz as well, um, who's asking if um, um, the question is around the correctly diagnosis of the, the cancer using PAPS AI and what image option was used to detect new cancer cases? What sorry, what what they are what they are using before our innovation? Yes, yeah, so the question is around uh, you know correctly using or correctly diagnosing uh, cancer using PAPS AI. So what image option was used to detect new cancer cases? Um, if you want further clarification about the question, I can ask the, the sender of the question. Uh, but the question is around what image option was used to detect new cancer cases um, in, in your uh, okay. technology. OK, thank you so much. Yo, so that one, we have also moved the actual in steps because so initially, the first steps we were using what they call a Bethesda. In cancer classification, there's a system it's called Bethesda Cancer Classification System, where that's what they use in the hospital when they are diagnosing for the cervical cancer. So they look at the image. So we have a paper. The paper is called Enhanced Physics Means Algorithm. If you read more about that paper, it will show you our first attempt where we were looking at the image extract debris extract everything not a cancer a cervical cell then extract a cervical cell then look at the physical parameters of this include the centric the diameter the perimeter the longest area because they have those dimensions they use so that was the first approach of using the bacteria science standard system for classification so that was when we are still in our PAPS ES using rigid rules and say if the area is in this range, which means the cell is cancerous. If the perimeter of the cell is this, 
which means the cancer is can the cell is cancerous or not. First, you move the debris. So we developed a debris removal approach where we get the slide, analyze for debris, eliminate it, extract cells, then analyze the cells. And we have four approaches we developed there. But it was also still very it was a chain of methods, which means an airline one method would give the, the airline another method. So then we went into having data sets and we said, you know, let us work with an expert and classify images for us so that our model, let the models look for the parameters itself so that we just have images that are classified as normal and normal. Then you have training data sets and the testing data sets and you train the model. So this PAPS AI, it has a training data set and a training data set of which way it was trained of what is right, sorry, what is positive, what is negative, as classified by an expert. And that's the level we are. But now, where we want to go, we have PAPS AI version 3 coming on, we even don't want to have that pre-trained because it is currently of supervised, but you want to have non-supervised approach. That is the ultimate end where we don't even need to first have an expert tell us because, yeah, I think, I think I've tried to answer it. Yes, I think you did. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Vasawa. Um, we have one more question, but I would also like to invite our attendees to, uh, we still have a few more minutes um, before we end the presentation. Uh, so if you'd still like to send in your questions, please do so. Um, Dr. Vasawa, well, the next question is about um, your, uh, your digital platform, PAPS AI. And whether you're using this screening, uh, whether you're using this uh, method or the digital platform just for screening purposes in Uganda, or uh, are you screen, are you using this outside Uganda as well? Okay, thank you so much. In in order, medical devices, medical devices industry is one of the new industries in 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 Africa. Most of the devices actually you have in Africa have been manufactured from out. So process are just being put in place to have certification of these devices and technologies. And it's, very, it's not easy to have a medical device on, have all the approvals and you have it used. It takes some time. So PAPS AI is just three years old. So we are currently implementing the OnSIMS. So OnSIMS is part of PAPS AI. So PAPS AI has both the microscope and an oncology functional element platform. So in support from the Royal Academy of Engineering, we are now implementing OnSIMS in Uganda and at the Mbara Regional Faro Hospital Cancer Clinic, and it's being used. So the microscope, it has, it's not yet used, but we plan maybe by the end of this year, we still run tests, get these tests, because we want to use all these tests to apply for the final approvals. It is still a process approval and improving. Thank you so much, Dr. Waswa. Um, we do have one more question uh, that has come in from Kumbuso, who's asking, um, are you using neural networks in the algorithm um, and kindly give a technical layout or insight of the AI model or the algorithm that you're using? Oh, that's that's very interesting. I wish I had my internet. The only issue is my internet is not very clear. But if my internet was better, I would have put on the video and an illustration. But what we have done, we are using a, a, a layered architecture, so it is a neural network with with layers. And what you have done, possibly have, like I have said, the first part was to say, okay, let us supervise and say. This is train. This is this is the positive. This is negative. So this is positive. This is negative. That's the first approach we're using for the planning. But now we have moved. We are trying to move away from that. And what we are trying to use is a neural network with three layers that has where we know that the futures are being. I don't know how I can. I don't know, but, but we have a last paper that we have tried to put up that has 
it's a deep illustration. I don't know how best I can explain it to you, but you can get in touch with me. Maybe I can share more of how we are building it because it is it is now that magic. It is that is our last magic. We are trying to make sure that we have a unique because we want to actually have we want to make sure that we have looked at existing neural networks that have been developed for classifying pub images. There's like a deep pub, there's deep pub, there is a survey, but you have looked at them, analyzed them, and you want to come up with a unique model, but with only three layers. And that is still some work in, in progress. Thank you so much, Dr. Waswa. Is, sorry. Yeah, uh, sorry, sorry, it's okay. I was just saying, but it's inspired by the dark net architecture. That's the approach we are using. Yes, uh, and I do appreciate, uh, Dr. Waswa, that you would like to share more information to respond to this question. And Kumbuso, as you've uh, rightly mentioned in the questions uh, message, uh, do connect with uh, Dr. Waswa on LinkedIn uh, to, to know more about this particular work. Uh, Dr. Mm. Waswa, we also have one question on um, on uh, the testing of this model. So have, have you tested this on any particular group of women uh, for getting a good result? Yes. That's why we said that we tested our data sets so far now on the data set, we had the test split data set. We tested on that, it was very excellent. But then we had six state patients. There was that slide, that's the slide that had six states, sorry to, to go back, but this, these six state pathology slides were actually patients that had already been diagnosed and they had their results, but you also wanted to see what the platform would give. And you have been able to get an overall accuracy of around 95% and sensitivity and accuracy, sensitivity and specificity of 190%. But we actually still gathering more because, and these 60 pathology slides were, I think, obtained using our microscope, but you are still getting more from our microscope and other microscopes so that you can also be able to compare. Thank you so much, Dr. Vasa, for clarifying that question. Um, we do not have any further questions, um, so I will be ending the Q&A session uh, very soon. Um, as I mentioned earlier, this webinar will be uploaded on the CSE's YouTube channel, and we will also share the recording on the CSE Knowledge Hub of Science and Technology in Development. We hope that by sharing this recording post webinar, uh, we will have further discussions uh, with our webinar speaker who is also a member of that particular knowledge hub. So if you do have any further discussions uh, or questions uh, for our webinar speaker, Dr. Vasua, please do get in touch with him on LinkedIn um, and also engage in further discussions once the webinar recording has been shared on the knowledge hub. Um, we also hope that uh, if you do work in collaborations, or if you do have, uh, if, if your discussions with Dr. Vaswa uh, proves to be fruitful and, and you do collaborate uh, on any work around artificial intelligence um, or, or a similar topic uh, related to your field of work or study, please do keep in touch with us and keep us informed. We would love to hear more from you uh, on this particular collaboration with Dr. Vaswa. Uh, once again, Dr. Vaswa, thank you so much for this uh, brilliant presentation. Um, we have received a couple of messages in the questions function about um, how, how good this presentation was. So thank you so much for this presentation. Um, you have given us great information about your work uh, in, in this innovative technology of PAPS AI and uh, also about your research uh, or uh, your PhD research study and how the, uh, the Commonwealth Scholarship has helped you on this particular piece of work. So thank you so much for this presentation, Dr. Vaswa. 
Thank you so much. And I'll really be happy to connect with anyone. I'm very willing and and open to have more connections with anyone interested in this type of work and their potential for more type of work in this field.